All right, I think we are live. That is very exciting. Good morning, New York. <laughs> My name is Nick Smith and I serve as first deputy public advocate in the administration of our city's public advocate, uh, Jamani Williams. This is a very exciting week for our entire team. Uh, we are in State of the People Week. As many of you know, the public advocate gives an address uh, every year uh, talking about uh, his vision for the office and what he sees as uh, both challenges and opportunities for this city. Uh, we have a really fantastic team uh, in the Office of the Public Advocate, uh, many of whom helped to actually put uh, the, if, the, the events that you'll see uh, this week together. And we are just thrilled to have you uh, view this uh, session. This week, you're gonna have uh, several sessions with deputy public advocates leading up to the Public Advocates Citywide Address, where we'll, uh, where we'll talk about several issues that uh, affect us and some really amazing wins that we've accomplished over the last year since you heard from the public advocate uh, last year. Uh, and for my panel in particular, the kickoff, I thought it made sense uh, in an era of cynicism about government to really bring in some movement leaders to talk about the work they are doing, how they accomplish their work, and looking forward what they see as uh, benchmarks or wins uh, going forward. So we have some really amazing experience uh, movement leaders that are going to introduce uh, themselves in a second. Uh, and then we'll talk about wins and how you can, in fact, make change through government. So with that, let me first allow Fabiola, our great team member, uh, to introduce herself briefly, and then we'll have other panelists do the same. So Fabiola, you have the mic. Hi, Nick. Thank you so much uh, for this invite. And um my name is Fabiola Mendieta Cuapio, Civic and Community Empowerment Coordinator uh, for the Office of the Public Advocate, but I'm also wearing different hats. Um, and today um, I'm gonna wear my hat as an immigrant justice advocate, um, not just for the Office of the Public Advocate, but also for the work on the ground um, that I have been doing for um, the immigrant community for, for many, many years. Thank you, uh, Fabiola. And I'll just briefly say uh, the office just returned from uh, a trip uh, in the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., where our team uh, went to D.C. to uh, push the federal government and, of course, the state government and, of course, the city on helping to resolve the, as Fabiola mentioned, the uh, migrant crisis. So although that's a very tough, uh, difficult situation, we have, in fact, had some successes and we have to give Fabiola tremendous uh, credit. She's been our team leader on much of that work. And so we'll get into that in a second. It's great to have you uh, on this panel, Fabiola. Uh, we'll go next to uh, Rob Solano, a longtime friend of the Office of the Public Advocate, uh, myself, uh, leader of CUF, Churches United for Fair Housing. Uh, they were uh, very central uh, in helping us pass what's called the Racial Impact Study. So uh, you all may know that uh, when developers want to uh, change uh, the use of a property uh, throughout the city, Oftentimes, they have to uh, go to the city council to get permission to, you know, change the use of that uh, uh, land or and or building uh, that is called a, a rezoning. Uh, essentially, uh, with many rezonings, there is the reality of uh, displacement, including racial uh, displacement. And so, as we know, New York City uh, has a really terrible affordable housing crisis where folks who grew up in our neighborhoods can't afford to live in the units that are either built or even uh, allegedly preserved uh, in our neighborhoods. And so uh, we spent several years figuring out uh, what is one tool in the tool shed that will help us understand uh, why this is happening, what is happening, and force uh, those who are uh, in the development community to really get to the demographic shifts uh, that are likely to occur if their projects are uh, built and or preserved as they plan it. Uh, our mission, and folks may know the public advocate himself, started his career as a tenant organizer. I went to the city council and chaired of the housing committee. And then of course, went on to become our city's uh, public advocate. And in all those years, uh, the public advocate has continued uh, to move the needle uh, on housing. But when it comes to housing, uh, we know the city of New York cannot do it alone. We've got to have state uh, partners and federal partners all working together to solve what continues to be just a devastating affordable housing crisis. So I'll give Rob a second to uh, introduce himself. Thank you for joining Rob. Thank, 
Thank you, Nick. He took all of my words. So I have to, <laughs> I'm going to go find other ones. Uh, well, first, a deep appreciation to Nick and, and the public advocate, Jamani Williams, who who he at Churches and After Fair Housing, we know him from the tenant organizer days and then the council member days. And uh, what I would want to share is um, I was born and raised in Williamsburg in a, in a time where um, we were just trying to survive, where our communities, which is not much different than Sunset Park and Brownsville and East New York and Jamaica, where we expanded as an organization. And now we're 35,000 members strong in New York City when we had to start it but about 5,000 with our humble days in Williamsburg. The, my first moment of advocacy uh, is as a young, uh, as a young uh, son of my mom, translating for her in, in bodegas, in government agencies. Uh, I had to be there at nine years old, the representation of my fam to, to not speak for her, but just translate the words that she was trying to say to these people. And it was deep. Right, it was about apartment. It was about the rent. It was about the heat. It was the Con Ed bill. It was the gas bill. It was all these incredible things that were happening in our community. We always figured it out as a family. Our community always figured it out, and with much success. When we let our communities define our future, when we let our people, our Latinx community, our BIPOC communities determine their futures, it always equals great success. When we let developers, the few, the one percent, right, the the greater affluent whiter community, dictate these communities, we end up with terrible policies, terrible inf infrastructure. So I am pleased to have this conversation. Talk about winds. Uh, the winds are hard in a, in systemic systems that are built to. Um, fail us. So they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're built, they're, they're created to suppress us. And with all that being said, we have the public advocate, we have a new generation of leadership into this uh, government uh, who are working alongside people like us to ensure change. Uh, change is incremental. It takes time, uh, but we're definitely doing it. And we definitely have some victories. I just wanted to add that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Robin. We look forward to getting into your segment. Uh, another uh, really um, just close to my heart uh, uh, win, I'll call it double win because we actually passed a law as Marilyn and Paul know, then we passed another version when we became, uh, when Jamaica became the, the public advocate, the uh, Fair Chance Act. So mm -hmm. back in uh, 2013, uh, we, uh, uh, well, I joined the, the, the council member Jamaica Williams team. And, you know, uh, he really said to me directly, um, you, I want you to figure out in the scope of what I'm most interested in, uh, what can we get done and bring the ideas to the table. And if that makes sense to me, Nick, we'll give you space and room to push those ideas. One of those ended up being uh, the Fair Chance Act. I have a fairly long history in both housing policy and justice policy. And so I saw there were a couple of cities and states uh, moving toward uh, this Fair Chance slash ban the box uh, movement. And essentially the uh, policy uh, prohibits uh, private and public employers from uh, asking about a criminal record until the conditional employment offer is met. And the reason that became so passionate for me, not only, you know, folks in my family with justice system involvement, uh, but I also, ha ha you know, I'm a black man in America looking at the racial disparities in our system. And so I thought if we can, as a city, uh, you know, uh, root out that level of discrimination as best we can, let's get it done. And we partnered with two really awesome uh, folks here, uh, Marilyn Reyes Scales and Paul Keith, both of whom I'll give a second to introduce themselves. But that was a, a like a five, four to five year uh, campaign to uh, get the city council and the mayor to uh, understand the issue uh, and, and get a bill drafted, uh, build a coalition to advocate all across the city for it. There were rallies and uh, things around the city. I recall a big one at, um, uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, and then we got the bill done. Uh, and that was a, an example of, again, how you can use uh, a combination of government and advocacy to uh, get it done. So why don't we allow Marilyn to briefly introduce yourself and then we'll go to Paul as well. Hi, thank you for having me. It's great Absolutely. to see you all. Um, hi, Paul. My name is Marilyn Reyes-Scales. I am a vocal New York board member. 
I am also co-director of the Peer Network of New York and many, many other hats. And I was proud to be an advocate for the Fair Chance Act, which has given me more opportunities in life and people who have gone through the same thing that I've gone through, people just like me that now are having jobs when at one time it was impossible to get a job. So I leave it there. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Uh, and, and you know, Marilyn kind of underplayed her role. Uh, she wasn't just an advocate. She was our co-lead advocate in getting that done when, when, uh, at, through Vocal New York. And she's now at the Peer uh, Network doing great uh, harm reduction and prevention work. So thank you so much, Marilyn. And Paul uh, undergirded the whole thing with that legal analysis as an attorney uh, when, uh, at CSS. So Paul, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Thanks for coming. Sure. Yeah, I'm Paul Keefe. I'm the Vice President for Legal Services at the Community Service Society of New York. Uh, back when we were working on the Fair Chance Act, I was a staff attorney there. Um, and then after we thankfully got it passed, I went to the Commission on Human Rights to enforce the law for seven years. I think, um, you know, what really drove me to work on the Fair Chance Act was um, my work at CSS, where we only serve people with criminal records in our legal department. And there was a law in New York State that said you couldn't deny, you couldn't discriminate against someone just because they had a record. And that law had been in effect since 1976. But of course, if you ask Maryland or anyone else if they've ever experienced discrimination despite that law, they would say yes. And the reason why is employers could ask about the record right away. And so it was, this was sort of a clear uh, uh, win, a clear way to make that law real. Uh, and I look forward to talking more about it. Thank you so much, Paul, uh, for all of your work. And we will be joined a little shortly uh, by the Brooklyn uh, Perinatal Network. Uh, folks may have seen a couple of years ago, uh, I said about a year ago, the public advocate and, and his wife uh, were very public about some of their uh, struggles in terms of uh, uh, conceiving and, and giving birth to their beautiful baby girl. Uh, and the, the topic of uh, Black maternal health. Uh, part of the function of the public advocate is to raise the issues that don't always get the most attention in the wider sphere. And so we decided, well, that, well, that's the topic we have to just tackle and address. And so, you know, sometimes pain becomes purpose and then uh, resolution or solution. Uh, we were able to move toward passing uh, a, a Black maternal health legislation to help move the needle in reducing uh, Black maternal uh, deaths, a, a better respectful care for expecting and new mothers, and making sure that uh, as a city we, we recognize that racial disparities exist, it's systemic, and it touches every, every area of life. Um, so we're so proud of that success and we'll be joined by um, Ngozi Moses in, uh, momentarily when she's uh, available and we're really excited. With that said, Fabiola, are you ready? So I know you have been doing so much amazing work in the immigrant justice movement. You have been a movement leader. Tell us briefly about how you came to this movement and what you brought in terms of the public advocate's office as well. And if you want to touch on the DC trip, feel free as well. Thank you, Nick. Uh, well, it was, um, I became to a member of this movement because I have my own experience. I came to the States at the age of 17 um, by myself. Um, and it was really, really hard for me. Um, I experienced firsthand the struggle at the border. Um, I saw so much discrimination. And one interesting thing about um, our communities, um, I'm an indigenous woman. Um, I'm an Nahua woman. A lot of people call us Latino, Latinx, Hispanics. Um, but in reality, we are people who look like me. Everybody has, have the assumption that we speak Spanish. We do. Some of us are privileged um, and we have the opportunity to leave our, our small towns to go to the city and learn Spanish. Um, but I, at the end of the day, when you cross the border, people who look like me uh, being discriminated, one, because you're a woman, two, because you're an indigenous, uh, and you you have um, a lot of challenges. So I experienced firsthand the discrimination, not just to, towards the indigenous communities, but also to the black immigrants who are fleeing their countries and they are stuck at the border. 
Um, one more um, reason why I become part of this movement is because my brother, um, who holds a, a visa and came to this country, um, was discriminated the second time when he tried to come to the States and he got deported. And that's when I was like, this is enough. This needs to stop. Also, when I receive a, a lot of phone calls from, from parents who are separated from their kids, you know, as a parent, I put myself in the position of those parents who are just get their kids stolen at the border. Um, and that's how we came involved in movement. And I'm going to continue this, this work. Um, I, I believe that every single person should be allowed to come to the States and to seek safety. Um, sometimes, you know, you, you don't have that privilege in your own home. So you have to cross the border, not because you, you want to. That's because um, you have reasons um, to flee violence, um, to flee danger. And sometimes because parents want a better life for their kids. Absolutely. Um, and I will just give a quick uh, you know, personal reflection of what I saw in those rooms. Uh, so the Office of Public Advocate, again, uh, you know, went to D.C. with our public advocate and, and met with federal agencies and legislators. And let me tell you, when Fabiola began to talk about uh, her personal story and then combining the fact that uh, she's a team member, we, we are team members. And, and so she's she has lived experience, but also she's in a position to help for some of the change. Uh, the faces and the responses from, you know, legislators, members of Congress and their staff uh, was one of. Wow, and, and really impressive agenda. Um, and we know how difficult an issue uh, this is. So we know what's, you know, all the panelists will talk about specific bills that, that, that have passed, but I wanted to begin here to show even with something as, uh, you know, gargantuan and difficult as the uh, migrant crisis, we can still define and uh, extract wins. So Fabiola, when you uh, were in DC with our team, talk about a sense of, what you saw as possibilities in terms of moving forward, whether it's the Biden administration or members of Congress or the state government or city government, what is your sense of you know, how you extract those wins as a movement leader? First of all, I, Nick, as you say, you know, when we got to those rooms, people were just looking at us and a lot of the elected officials question, why now? why PA comes to DC, why PA, first of all, um, for me, I always say that the real advocates are not on social media 24 seven, the real advocates are on the ground. And one thing I can say for sure is that the public advocate, when we have one-on-one, -on -one, I have to sit down with him and share my own story. For me, it's really hard to share my own story. I'm a survivor of human trafficking. I have so many struggles, but when I opened my heart and I, I said, you know what? We have a crisis and, not, and it's not the people. It's not the people, it's we can make change. So when PA asked me, tell me, what can we do? Guide us. That was like, wow. You know, you have the public advocate humble men who say, guide me, let me know what can we do. And when we sit in the room, we have all the facts. We talk to the elected official, we talk to Congress people with, with senators, and we brought real stories. We brought all the facts. We brought all the truth. And, and the PA talked from a point of view as an elected official, but also as a human being. Right. Yep. And when we have that conversation one-on-one -on -one with the with with the reps, everybody was like, that is we we can that is change. We can make change happen. That's right. We can make sure that these people can be welcomed with dignity 
to the states because that's who we are. That's how we are as human beings. That's who we are as New Yorkers. Absolutely. It was an amazing experience. The reps were just listening, agree with us. And actually the one page, I have to say that, yes, it was me who gave, you know, uh, 200% of me working a month and a half to put, you know, all these legislations that we support, all these advocates, um, get a lot of meetings, but also it was a teamwork. Mm -hmm. It was a team effort. Uh, we have people that work for the Office of the Public Advocate that we have our own experience and we use our own experience to make change. So I just want to say that government, yes, they can make change, but they have the, we need, we need more from them. We need more from the state. We need more from the federal government. Mm -hmm. We just need to make sure we have a pathway to citizenship. We have heard from many immigrants. We just want to work. That's we right. want to provide. And I have my own experience. I have never said I, I have not had the need to depend um, to apply for food stamps. I never say I, I, I don't need, you know, a little, a little help. But I have a good circle of people who help me to be who, you know, to be where I am right now. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't have that privilege. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in language access is other factor. I'll just, you know, as a share. Sure. People, reps, and you know this, Nick, reps, when we talk to them, they were like, but why language access? And when I share my story and I said, people that look like me, you assume that I speak Spanish. We have a huge number of indigenous communities, not just from Guatemala, Honduras, or Mexico, from around the world, and we're not there yet. So how can an immigrant seek help if we don't have language access with all the information, one pager, and, and to guide them and tell them where to go? That's absolutely right. And it was an amazing opportunity. It was, you know, but it, for me, the huge takeaway, it was to see the public advocate, you know, speaking from the heart, and speaking from, you know, all, all New Yorkers. And he always emphasized, we are to the point where it's them versus us. Should not be this way. It should not be this way. Um, and the other thing that we saw, Nick, is we talk about the black immigrants. It's, we have discriminated um, black immigrants for a long time. And like I said, I experienced that firsthand inside the detention center many years ago. And I have not seen change. It's time to make change. It's time to make sure government do their piece and work. Absolutely. Wow, that, that was extremely powerful. And literally our first example on this panel of, you can make government work. Even when the challenge crosses international borders, we took a message to the nation's capital saying you've got to uh, deal with work authorization, language, language access, and frankly, uh, fund some of the services in the city that have long been neglected to avoid what the public advocate and Fabiola said is the us versus them uh, framework. That, that was, thank you so much Fabiola. And we look forward to, to seeing your continued uh, work on this process and thank you for sharing your, your, your story. We really, really appreciate it. Um, let's go to, to shift from uh, the, uh, the immigration uh, to housing in a few minutes. Uh, back to Rob, Rob Solano from Cuff. Um, so tell us Rob, in terms of the racial impact study, and you may want to give a quick summary of what exactly it is, and maybe like impact study, why are you, why are you doing a study? We don't need any more studies. We know what the data says. <laughs> so that might be a question to folks like, do you need a study? But talk about you know, how you came to that bill as a solution and what you see going forward in terms of uh, a more uh, demographically, including racially, um, just and equitable development process in New York 
when we know, frankly, there's a very large and powerful uh, real estate industry in the city? I have about two minutes, uh, so I'll do my best to tell you how we got here. But we'll give you three because I know, I know that was a big one <laughs> for us, right? Because I don't want to speak for other folks' journey, but for our journey, 13 years ago, when we started Churches United for Fair Housing um, in Williamsburg, we had just saw um, our birth came from the ending of a rezoning called the 2005 uh, Williamsburg Greenpoint rezoning. And at that time, that rezoning was pitched to the community that was there as an opportunity for open space and reopening the waterfront for the community as a great give back to the people that live there, right? Uh, uh, we had some doubts about that uh, as a community, right? We had some doubts about the, um, the genuineness of that all, of that pitch. It had zero affordable housing as a component uh, because, and I want to remember this, we don't need to build affordable housing because there wasn't there any, anything anyway, so it all cancels each other out. Since there was no housing there and we're adding housing, this will not have an impact on the community. It will just only have a, all benefits for the community. This was in 2004 or five when we started rumbling in the 09 when we really got started. So. It was then when we knew that our stories were not enough to government. Our examples, our rent bills, even then was a struggle. Those were part of it. But the other part was data. What is the fact? Where is the fact that says that we don't see that? And so that from that day on, from 09, all the way 10 years later, when we started talking about the racial impact study, we needed to wait for the data because to that point, other than a few people like Jamani, and we were crazy. Oh, you, this is New York. We're the most diverse city in the world. This is not happening in New York City. We're, we're not segregated. We are completely in unity. We take the same train. We, you, you all are making everything about race again. This is crazy. Let's talk about low income housing. Let's talk about that. Let's focus on that. In reality, we didn't want to talk about that. We wanted to talk about race. We wanted to discuss how we were living the impact as our communities were being gentrified. And unfortunately, I have to use censor, census terminologies because I can't even use the terminology we like to use. So just census data started to start to show, data started to show that our communities were being displaced, right? And how they define our community right, Latino or Hispanic, right, as they define this community, which is a big swoop of the community. So really why we needed the data was it needed to start to show proof that this experience that we were living, uh, unless you live it, unless you're in it, you don't think it's true, right? If you live on the Upper East Side or if you take uh, the train from other neighborhoods, and this is not your every day and your rent is stabilized and you have plenty of money and everything is okay. Our truth is not a truth. Our truth is this a cuento, a story, something that's happening to you and, and we're blaming something. We needed our journey to be, to be undeniable, which is the unfortunate truth of many of our New Yorkers. When white people say something, it's true. When a black person says something or Hispanic, like an ex, whatever we want to put us all in there, BIPOC community, we have to do double the fact checks, double the journey is harder for us. We need to cross all of our I's and dot our T's. And it has to be a perfect presentation of why a racial impact study needs to be created uh, because 15,000 Latinx community members were taken out of Williamsburg and 28,000 white people were inserted in 10 years. There's a problem. And not enough that I was saying it, not enough that church members were saying it, not enough that abuelitas were saying it, not enough that young people were saying it. Didn't matter. We needed some census information, a, a, a pretty strong organization and other advocates to get together to finally get to a point where this was heading about race and no longer about low income housing and high income housing, it had to start to become about uh, race. 
And I'll end it with this. Mm -hmm. The Broadway Triangle rezoning, which was the one that was taken to court, was a incredible foundation to to set this thing off, right? Which credit to Jamani as a council member was one of the votes that said no to that rezoning, which said, I think this is going to have a bad racial impact if you let that zoning go through. That zoning was stopped in the courts, where in the court, the judge referred to the Fair Housing Act as uh, the reason to stop it, right? Mm -hmm. It felt like it was going to violate the Fair Housing Act. So all of that being said, I was about 10 years. It took a court, a judge to determine this that actually gave us the first opportunity that we were finally, anyone outside of our world validated us and was like, it's clear, I am a judge. This is going to violate the Fair Housing Act. Here you go, go figure it out. That was one of 100 Bloomberg rezonings. Yep. 99 got through and this one didn't. And so I just wanted to, that was kind of like the birth, us and other advocates, that was the birth of this tool. Absolutely. And, and, and I hope uh, viewers uh, really see uh, when we talk about, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the migrant crisis, uh, the housing crisis, all of these are big, gargantuan problems. But you're hearing from these movement leaders, you can and this is a phrase I always use, move the needle. So I wish we could wave a, a you know, magic wand right now and, and, and solve all these problems. But, we know, that's not realistic. And so it does require. Uh, committed, dedicated folks who, one, understand the issues, two, understand strategy to remain focused and uh, move toward uh, solutions. And so, uh, you know, the public advocate is finally able to work with Rob and Cuff and, and other advocates uh, to draft and pass uh, this uh, racial impact study, which, by the way, for the first time requires developers when they are submitting applications to the city council uh, to, as I mentioned earlier, change how they're using a, a piece of land or a building uh, to include in the, the those documents the racial impact and how it may change uh, that and also the rent uh, levels and burdens. So that council members, when they vote on these rezonings, have much more information available to them so that they are uh, better able to say to their constituents, uh, I'm voting no for this reason. This particular project will uh, cause displacement uh, with, you know, primarily uh, Latino, Hispanic, but Latinx and Black New Yorkers, uh, and rents will go up uh, X amount projected. I mean, folks know in Manhattan, the new numbers show the average rent is north of $4,000, I believe, for a, a one or two bedroom for a family of four, $4,000 a month. No one thinks that's affordable. So the impact study empowers council members with core, clear data on what we all kind of know, and they're better able to move in the way that, you know, residents think they should move. Is that a good summary you think, Rob? Yes, absolutely. I, I do think that y'all have done a great work of moving past the, does it do that? And that wasn't that long ago where people were still kind of, city planning will still say today, to this day, that rezonings do not change the demographics of a community. They will still utter that sentence as of today, that rezonings do not have that impact. They're crazy. That's not true. Right. right. The facts and the scientists are saying that it is, and you all have done a great job to now has to be self-declared in the beginning. What is the anticipation of this perfect? That is a perfect explanation. Right? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, really happy to continue working with Cuff on, on, on housing overall, and there's much more to do. Uh, obviously, there's a federal agenda there's a state agenda, there's a city agenda as well. So this, again, for viewers, this just shows you with that huge topic, you can extract a win and keep and keep the fight going. So Rob, thank you for that, uh, for uh, your work and, and Cuff's work and all the advocates on, on the housing pieces. We're gonna go a uh, shift uh, to uh, Ms. Denise West. It's great to see you from the Brooklyn Perinatal Network, Deputy Director, uh, talking about, again, as we mentioned at the top, uh, black maternal uh, health. But we know very much in terms of not just New York, but across the country, there is a crisis when it comes to uh, black maternal health and the discrimination, uh, racism, and systemic bias that black women face in medical facilities, including during one of the most precious times of all of our lives, uh, giving, giving birth, women giving birth. Um, and so thank you 
uh, Denise for joining. I would just say the public advocate was able to pass a bill requiring um, a, a improved and better a respectful care uh, at birth and uh, an imposition of rights uh, to those uh, giving uh, birth. And, you know, we can do that without our partners, including the Brooklyn uh, Perinatal Network. So, Denise, thank you for joining. And just give us a little more, talk to us more uh, as someone who is a longtime advocate in this space about what the problem is and how you see city government helping to solve that problem specifically. Thank you for joining. Thank you, and good morning. And um, I just want to share, uh, and Gozi Moses wanted to be here, and sorry that she could not uh, be here. Uh, first, I want to say that the other speakers spoke and it impacted, we need to look at intersectionality. When we talk about housing, that problem still exists for pregnant moms and birthing people as well. All of the areas that you have talked about today, we need to see how they impact on each other. So one, let's see how we can work together. They're not isolated. Housing is not isolated from people that are birthing and having the problems at um, in the hospital. So I've been doing this work for almost 40 years and 40 years we still have had this problem. And it's not because BIPOC people body is different. They, they have some type of blood that's not functioning correctly. We're talking about underlying structural racism. We're talking about implicit bias. We're talking about a patriotic that has allowed this to continue to happen that black women throughout the country are three to four, uh, times more likely to suffer or die during pregnancy, preventable pregnancy incidents. And over 100% of women that have near miss death, all because of the color of their skin, all because of the color of their skin. I am really proud and happy that we are able to partner with the public advocate. Uh, as I shared before, the legislation that was passed with city council this past year is groundbreaking because it hasn't been presented or passed in over 35 years that I've been doing this type of work. That's just a simple thing uh, to mention that why do we die why do we die doing something that's natural? Um, uh, one of our colleagues, the co one of our coaching colleagues has t-shirts that say black women shouldn't die giving birth. And we shouldn't. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Denise. And you know, I, 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 you're right about, of course, intersectionality, but also um, it, it, partnerships. And so I'd be remiss if I didn't say uh, not only has the public advocate passed some bills here and, and talked about uh, his and his wife's uh, story, uh, but the city council and other members have passed other bills as well in a coalition with our office and, of course, the um, city council speaker, Adrian Adams, uh, to help move the unit forward. And one thing that struck me that you just said, Denise, was the fact that you've been in the work, uh, doing the work for about 35 years, and these bills have become groundbreaking uh, because they hadn't happened in that entire time. Asher, can you just take a minute and talk about that piece of it in terms of the duration and, and you know, why you have to put in so much time and work and you really shouldn't have to, as you mentioned, doing something that, that is the most natural thing. Can you just talk about that piece and what that felt like to see uh, those wins and, and successes? It was, it gave me pleasure to know that finally, you know, because oftentimes when you're working in the field, you're like, Am I making a difference? Are we making a difference? The perinatal networks that were started was started under Governor Como's uh, dad, not not uh, Daddy Como, mm -hmm. uh, because the, right Mario, mm -hmm. um, Mario, um, because there were we had to look at healthcare not in the medical model. We had to look at it in the social context, right? And but then what was City Council doing? Right, and we had to advocate for the infant mortality reduction initiative that gave some spot money good, but only filled in some gaps. So when we look at women are still dying, we're really not impacting. And then when we look at uh, individuals from 
Caribbean countries that do well, but the longer they stay in the city, the worse their outcomes become because they get acclimated to the city. We're saying, what do we need to do? So having this groundbreaking legislation where legislators are trying to get it, where legislators, as you mentioned, have also had the same experience. So we know it's not the social economic status that you are, right? We have legislators in city council now that had near miss, near miss death or lost their baby. So we know that this is real. Absolutely. Being able to finally say, yes, we're going to make, because you have to put resources in there. The communities that we're talking about do not have the resources that is needed. They get pro programs that come in, they, they stay for three to five years, and then they're gone when it takes three to five years just to get grounded and rooted and begin to make an impact. That's right, and 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 I would add that the, the names are just are far too many. If the New Yorkers may recall, just a couple of years ago, the tragic loss of Shaisha Washington, um, mm -hmm. in terms of her giving birth to her her, her child and and the devastation obviously their family felt. And Denise mentioned there were folks that are in government with um, you know, experience in terms of, of health and, and and losses. And 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 I am proud that the office of the public advocate in a coalition with the Brooklyn Perinatal Network, Network and others are helping to raise this issue. It just requires a coalition to keep erasing the issue due to uh, the, I think as you mentioned, the systemic bias and, and the lack of attention uh, paid to, to our communities. And so that's something we'll continue uh, to do. So Denise, thank you uh, and your team for all of your work and we look forward to continuing uh, to help um, resolve this issue. Thank you so much, Denise. Really appreciate Thank you. it. Absolutely. Uh, and we'll now go to uh, back to Marilyn and Paul in terms of a band of box and a fair chance in terms of the, again, racial disparities uh, and, and other disparities in our uh, so-called justice uh, system. Um, it, justice system is an interesting uh, term, <laughs> but that's the catch all we have. So um, talk about uh, Marilyn, you know, you mentioned very briefly at the top if you're willing, your lived experience and when that law that you helped push for passed, I will never forget, Marilyn, that phone call you gave me, I think that was 2015, and you called so excited, and I think I knew what you were going to say, and you said it. And what you said was, Nick, I am so excited. For the first time, and I think you said 30 years, I've got my first full-time job thanks to the Fair Chance Act. Do you recall that phone call? Yes. Yes, I was emotional and in tears, you know, but it was all worth, this fight has all been worth it because I came home in 1997 from Albion State Prison. So, you know, I went through work release. I got a little part-time job here, but I was never able to keep a job. Like it was only temporary because you are work release, you know, they hire you because they get funding, you know, the stores or whoever's hiring you, they get extra funding for hiring people like us. So after parole was over, I, I was left, you know, with nothing. So, um, I started, that's when I started doing peer work and then I started becoming in, you know, in doing advocacy with Vocal New York. And I became interested when somebody once mentioned to me, oh, there's this Fair Chance Act, Ban the Box, Jamani Williams. Um, that's how I met you, Nick. That's and, right. <laughs> yeah, and um, I was like, really? They're really trying to do that for people like us? I, could, I was in shock, mm. you know, because I was struggling. I came home in 97, and this was in 2013 or 2012 around that time when I started hearing about Band the Box. Mm -hmm. So I was like, wow, really? They're starting to do that? So I decided to share my story, but I didn't know the impact that it would make on people like us. You know, I was new to advocacy. I was new to so much. And, you know, I fought for this. I shared my story. I put my life on the line. Um, my kids heard my story publicly, you know, so I was putting my, I was very vulnerable, you know, I was putting myself out there, but there was a real issue that affected my life. 
you know i really wanted to be self-sufficient i wanted to be you know support my children and i couldn't you know it was a struggle i had to live on um, public funding you know public um like welfare um snap you know and i wanted to be self-sufficient i didn't come home to go back to where i was i wanted to grow and be better you know especially for my children you know because i'm also a former user so i had stopped using when i went to prison and i didn't want to use no more i wanted to just become have a stable life support my children be able to have an apartment which i still struggle with because of my record and that's something another thing that we got to keep pushing forward but um i remember saying i'm i'm a 52 year old woman that never has never had a full-time job wow that was real wow. 52 years old i am 60 now and i've kept a full-time job you know and if it wasn't for jamani and nick and vocal who and paul because paul did a big part of this the legal part yep. but you know we we did it together this unity and that was that was the most powerful thing and we had other people that came in and shared their stories and so it wasn't just the issue that i was experiencing but there was a whole community that was experiencing this and this that's the power of unity and really pushing you know, especially when you have elected officials that really come from the community and really have seen how this affects us. So they fight harder, you know, that's powerful. But um, um, I, I can't say how grateful I am to you, mm -hmm. to Paul, to Jamani, and Jamani has stood in my life ever since he met me which we support each other with whatever issues you have too. That's right. You know, and that's amazing. You know, yeah. we build a, a partnership, you know? You know, yeah. I, you know, I can almost say, damn, that's my family. Well, you are. That's very <laughs> no, I, I, I know, but people look at me like I'm crazy, but you know, <laughs> it's real, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, my kids are proud of me. My family's proud of me. They've seen me grow. And that's what this law did. It helped me grow. It helped me keep a job. Open doors for me that I never thought were open for me. I'm not gonna say who I work for, but I'm gonna make in December, I will make five years at my current job, which is a full-time job, which I have a pension, which I have health insurance, something that I never had before. Wow. So thank you. What do you say, Marilyn? What, like, what, how do you how do you follow that? <laughs> uh, amazing, amazing. Um, yeah. And, and you know, one thing we didn't say was there were two rounds of fair chance. There was the 15 version, and then there, we passed an update a couple of years yeah. ago uh, to cover yeah. uh, uh, ACDs and, and yeah. violations. So we just we didn't do just uh, you know arrests and convictions. We added a couple of years ago uh, ACDs and yeah. violations. So we continue the work, right? It, 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 that, that's, that's right. Amazing. That's right. That's right. Because when I was doing organizing, I was a civil rights organizer of local New York at that time. Um, what I did was, you know, I went to courthouses. I went, and that was a big issue when I went to courthouses because people couldn't get, you know, they couldn't get jobs because they had open case or AC, what ACDs is it? Yep. You know, they they were having difficulties having, you know, getting their life back. You know, you know, everybody makes mistakes. That doesn't make you a bad person. Exactly. You know, I, at the time, that doesn't make me a bad person. Yep. You know, and people, you know, just because you have a criminal record, they want to assume that, you know, you can't be, you're not employable or you're, you, you can't be trusted with housing or you can't be. It's all structural violence. Absolutely. That's what that is. Well said. That's all structural, structural violence. violence. Wow. That's right. Yes. Thank you so much for that, Marilyn. Uh, but on. thank you. Oh, thank you. No, thank you for, for sharing your story and helping us get that done two times, and I know there's much much more we're gonna be doing together. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Paul, I mean, again, Marilyn mentioned it. This is a real coalition and you've got to, uh, I, I often hear and often say, uh, bring the tool that you have to the table and figure it out in, a, in, in coalition and the gumbo of different tools. You came through, and I recall those phone calls with the real understanding of the law as it existed, of an understanding of disparate impact, uh, of understanding of, of how to uh, really push back when you got an argument that didn't make sense, but those in power 
could could call the play. So, you know, in terms of your, um, you know, experience, talk about, you know, that briefly and then also looking forward uh, in terms of, you know, getting the fair chance done. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, fair chance would have gotten wouldn't have gotten done with uh, organizers like Maryland and, and Vocal, and all the other um, groups that joined with us. You know, I always joke that I'm I'm just like the lawyer in the room to say everything's going to be okay. You know, like mm -hmm. the sky is not going to fall uh, when lobbyists from businesses or other um, other groups oppose the act raise arguments, you know, I would be the one who could point to the law and say, you know, it's not actually going to do that. You know, you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, like the sex offender driving the school bus or whatever sort of, you know, scare uh, tactics that they want to use. Um, and then, you know, for me, I was lucky to have a long uh, history of working with people with records uh, who experienced employment discrimination. And so I had a sense uh, of what sort of legal changes could be made to really make it real, make their rights real, because, you know, um, you have people coming out or who've recently been convicted and they've, and they've decided that they want to change. But what does our law say? It says, well, you have to look at how old the conviction was and how long, how long that's happened. And, you know, if you've just decided to make the decision to change your life after something like this happened to you, there's not a whole lot there that you can draw on. And so what the Fair Chance Act does is say, an employer has to decide that you are the person that they want to hire. So they've decided to hire you. You're the person you're qualified. And then they look at the negative information about you. And then they really present it with the choice of given all that I know about this person and how they would fit into the workplace, is the conviction really going to be that big of a deal? And then if the employer decides that it is, there's all this process on the back end that they have to do. They have to give a person the copy of their background check, uh, a written explanation under the law about why uh, they're, uh, they could legally use their conviction against them, and then time to respond. And the whole point of that is when working with clients, you understand, and as organizers, you understand as well, people are really good advocates for themselves. All they need is that chance, right? And the Fair Chance Act says you have to give it to them. There's no way around it. And so that is sort of creating the opportunity for uh, interactions between people that might not ordinarily talk to each other. And that's one way that we could sort of change this criminal punishment system is when you have people with serious records who now are working in a, in a job amongst people who, you know, don't have that kind of background. They're just having, they're just normal people. You know, they're the bus driver, there's someone else, you know, there's someone in the office that works with you that has a record. And the point is, is um, we don't get that opportunity uh, unless it's legislated, because everyone wants to believe that, you know, what the worst thing on your record is who you are right now. And what this law tries to do is say, no, there's a, a more of a story here, and you need to pay attention to that story. That's right. And and I really hope New Yorkers see in, in, in all of these movement leaders that change is possible. And I know that is a cliche, but we now have four examples to show you, not just tell you. Uh, and so, again, I understand the cynicism. I get it. You turn on the news and you see stuff about a certain former president or Congress not getting anything done or a possible uh, debt ceiling crisis or, and all this mess. Some of, that's, some of that mess is noise. We've got to stay focused on our um, priorities and objectives. And frankly, I think as Denise said earlier, it's about survival. <laughs> and so all that noise is baked into the game of politics, uh, but that, you know, we've got to just stay focused. And I'm so glad we have all these awesome speakers to show New Yorkers, don't give up on government. Change can happen. You heard about a bunch of wins. Here's where we want to uh, end the conversation, kind of where we started, uh, a bit of reflection. So we would love to hear from each uh, leader on this call. What's next in terms of uh, your work? So you are there passed a bill or you've gone to DC to, to lobby uh, federal agencies or, uh, you know, push them to, uh, you know, pass some bills. By the way, we forgot to mention a uh, very important terms of housing and Denise's point about intersectionality, uh, area median income. Federal government uh, sets AMIs regionally and because our AMIs are so high uh, to um, uh, uh, li uh, live in uh, federally subsidized housing, 
That's another reason why folks can't afford these apartments because the income guidelines are just too high. And so one thing we did in DC was push a, a particular agency and members of Congress say, hey, New York City needs a very specific localized AMI because the cost of living here is so high relative to other states surrounding us, so New Jersey, Connecticut, et cetera. We need that. And so again, uh, with a unified voice, we can push on these very difficult and hard issues. But I'll just uh, actually open the floor and you all can go in whatever order you want. Talk about what's next when it comes to your advocacy work. And it could be a bill, it could be a budget item, it could be building a coalition. What's next for you all? Anyone can take that in order that you choose. So, for me, what's sure. next is sure. <laughs> um, I still working with um, the organizations that are working to close Rikers Island because we need to really keep this public health issue. All these issues of public health because housing instability and so much more that we got to close Rikers and really give people real public health services so they can grow and stop being punitive. It's about time we start healing. That's what we need to heal as a community so we could get better. If we keep getting punitive, it's not going to help us at all. and We're not going to continue to grow. Right. So we need to close Rikers now. Yeah, and the public advocate agrees. <laughs> and uh, sometimes it can be hard to nail down exactly what's happening with closed records. But what we do know is uh, a law was passed, a land use action was passed to require the closure of Rikers Island. So, uh, yeah, so but everybody's passed. stalling. Right. It's like with the overdose crisis, you know, yep. Safe, the overdose prevention centers, those are needed all statewide. And we're still, yeah. we're still dying. Nobody's mm. doing nothing. Uh, mm. Bronx has the highest. I'm from the Bronx. So, you know, I see it all the time. I live it, I breathe it, I eat it. Like, yeah. I work in it. Like, everything is, is tragic in the Bronx. And, you know, and all over. Because it's, if you're poor, you're a person who's poor, you're going to suffer. You know, and we need better, better laws. I mean, everybody here is doing great work, but we need so much more. That's right. I agree. Well, with you all a part of it, we're going to be great. Uh, Denise, Fabiola, Rob, Paul. What's next? Sure. So I, I, I'll go. So we know that we just talked about Black maternal health, that the momness bill is one bill that we really want to get passed um, at all levels and not components of it, but all of the bill. We are also working, and I know the Bronx is, some of my colleagues in the Bronx is working on the birthing center, getting birthing center. We need to be able to have options of how women can birth. It's not the hospital birth is not the only way. Home birth, birthing centers is the other. And the other piece that our coalition, New York Coalition, is working on is passing more funding for doula, community-based doula work. We want every woman that's eligible to get a doula, but we need to make sure that it's livable wage. So I'm not asking bills to be passed for this doula work in birthing centers, but proper and livable uh, funding for it so that it can really operate. We know a lot of our city hospitals, oh, they are open, but they have very little resources, very little funding, and we complain about them, but th those are the communities that see the highest need and the under-resourced population. So that's what's next for us is really getting appropriate funding for doula services, uh, birthing centers, and getting the momness bill passed. Awesome. And uh, as I said earlier, we're standing right beside you to help get that done. Mom and the bus and the budget. So let's let's do that. Uh, Fabiola, what's next? What's next for me? Um, before, Nick, if I, I may, I just want to say that we have the opportunity now to build a system that reflects our true values as a New Yorkers, as a country. Um, and, you know, 
every every state, every city, every community has the capacity to welcome people who flee in danger and persecution. And I know that. I know that for sure. And we must work together in coordination um, rather than failing into a trap of being divided against each other. We can actually help ensure a better immigration system for all. And this... Oh, I think we lost Fabiola. Okay, when she comes back in, we'll go right back to her. Uh, but Rob and, and Paul, uh, what's next for you all? I'll toss it to the attorney. Okay. Uh, for us, we are uh, working a lot on the Clean Slate Act, uh, which is a New York State bill that would uh, seal criminal convictions for most civil purposes after a certain amount of time has passed. And so seven years for felonies, three years for misdemeanors, um, running from date of conviction or release from incarceration, whichever is later. Uh, and actually that type of uh, framework was in the first Fair Chance Act before uh, it got amended and, and the version that was finally yeah. passed. So um, that would be really helpful because, you know, uh, everyone can agree at a certain point a criminal conviction shouldn't matter anymore. Um, there's laws now that allow people to seal convictions that are more than 10 years old if the person has no more than two convictions, only one of which can be a felony. And those are routinely granted by judges and not opposed by district attorneys because everyone understands if you've been out of trouble for 10 years, like that's it, like your life is different. And so why are we still saddling people with these records? But I see Fabiola is back on. So let's go back to her. Fabiola. Yeah, thank you. And I just want to share, and this is more personal news and personal to me. Um, I just lost my dad recently, last week. And when the public advocate saw me joining this meeting and he saw me at Port Authority welcome asylum seekers, he asked me, he said, you need time to rest. You need to go home and make sure you have time to be. You wanna make sure that you take care of you now. And my dad always said that I should not be a rest. It's so much to do. And I just want to make sure that now more than ever, because there is no more borders between me and my dad, that he is beside me, whatever I go, that we push harder and we work with every community. So our brothers and sisters that being treated by the immigration system in a, in a very fair way that we work and we, we need to make sure that everyone is welcome with dignity. And I will continue the work. What's next for me? Going to the Hill if it's needed. Going to the White House if it's needed. We need an immigration reform now. Again, how do you follow that? Um, I, I, I obviously was aware, wasn't going to, you know, say that without your uh, permission. Uh, but again, this really goes to show the power of people working on these issues. Condolences, Fabiola, and power, because I can hear uh, the power in your voice uh, in terms of your father, your family, your experiences. And this is what makes it all worth it. So uh, seriously, thank you. Um, for your voice and continue to work in what I know is a very, very, very tough time. And I see some comments here with sympathy, but we, we, we really appreciate that, uh, Fabiola. Thank you, thank you. Um, Paul, will you finish with your part? And if not, we, we'll go to, uh, to a Rob. Uh, I'm an attorney, so I can always say more, but I will, I'll hand it off to Rob. Okay. Oof, um, my, my, my deepest condolences to you. Um, um, I lost my mother and father. I know how hard that it is. And that was two years ago on the same day. And it felt like it was yesterday. It, it, it doesn't leave you. It, 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 um, but, but it would, but no way to segue into that other to say to folks that, um, don't try to power through, right. 
in um I don't and I and I appreciate the public advocate talking about therapy uh, sometimes if you need that to I go to therapy um I say it often uh so people can maybe get uncomfortable <laughs> because in uncomfortability there's an opportunity to be to be vulnerable and in vulnerability, there's an opportunity for us to come together and grow. And I, I have a deep appreciation for the public advocate when he says, I'm not okay. I, I'm not okay. I'm not doing well today. Uh, I need a moment. I need a, I need a day. Um, I can't be at that presser. I, 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 okay, I'll go to the presser, <laughs> but, I, but I'm going to be, I'm not okay. Um, I love that um, we have leadership that says that. And um, lets us know that it's okay not to be okay. And this work is hard. This work is challenging. Um, and I am proud to do this with all of you and uh, inspired every day to, uh, to do this work. And I don't want to do anything else. I want to do this. How, uh, and I appreciate y'all. And, and so what's next? What's next is telling our folks to take a moment, to take a breath, um, to take a small victory when it comes, because it's hard when the winds come. And when they come, celebrate. I'll be know how to celebrate. Dance, music, food. Love it. Just, just party. It's okay to party, be in joy, and be in that. And Monday morning is the work is on Monday morning. It's gonna be there, but let's make sure we're in community and we're in love. And that's what's next at Cuff. We're gonna be really hard about that at Churches and Fair Housing. We're gonna do work. We're gonna take a moment. We're gonna give that PTO when people need it. More importantly, when the victory comes, we're gonna party it up and there'll be food and all the good stuff around it. So I just wanted to throw that back. What's next for us? I love that. Uh, the, the New Yorkers, this has been an amazing conversation and I, I just I'm glad we'll be able to spotlight those moving leaders that you see here uh so much power um solid wins more work to do um I do want to make sure that folks uh see the upcoming uh, events uh, our, our, our wonderful team uh our deputy digital media director Mariel Clifford uh put on the system the link to um for the upcoming uh, panels leading up to the public advocates uh, citywide state of the people address. I'm looking forward to those panels. Uh, this has been an amazing uh, kickoff. So thank all of you for your voice, uh, your work, uh, and your power. And uh, we're so thrilled that you were able to join us. Um, before we uh, wrap, I just want to make sure that we uh, give resources. Uh, so if uh, in New York is watching, if you have an issue you need to talk to the office about, uh, you can email us at gethelp at advocate.nyc.gov or call 212-669-7250. That's 212-669-7250. The email again is gethelp at advocate.nyc.gov. And we're on the social media channels at NYC Public Advocate. Thank you. This is fulfilling. Uh, I hope New Yorkers really learns a lot about what you all are doing in, in coalition with us. And uh, there, there's more to do. So let's go to the uh, future panels and let's move forward with a sense of optimism because based on what we see here, we can do it. Thank you all so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.